すいません。はい。抹茶の入ったカクテルとかできますか。もちろんです。かしこまりました。Today's video was brought to you by my debut feature film, Matcha and Vanilla, out now on Gaga Ooh La La. You know, I want to be alone. If you've ever said that, you have been quoting, knowing or unknowingly, Greta Garbo. And today I want to talk about what if Garbo had made more films? There just aren't any faces like that anymore. Maybe one, Garbo. Hmm. Now, Garbo, for those who don't know, is、uh, a star of the 30s and, well, the 20s, the 30s, and the beginning of the 40s. She famously retired or went on a permanent hiatus from filmmaking.、Um, After the less than stellar response to、uh, her last film, Two Faced Woman.、Um, but as she said, she never intended to retire, she just never got a, a script that she really liked.、Um, some people would say、mm, that uh, uh, a mutual friend of hers and Uh, Dietrich, Marlena Dietrich had kind of talked her into retiring. But the truth is, well, she wasn't that diff- it wasn't that difficult to convince her to retire because she really despised public life. Like she, except for her first couple of films, she never gave interviews, she never responded to fan letters. Um, but she just became this enigma that everybody thought, like,、oh, you know, even Barbara Walters, the late Barbara Walters, said, you know, at the peak of her career, like, oh, I'll, I'll retire if I, can, if I can interview Greta Garbo, but you know, she never granted any interviews.、Um, now, she did say that she never personally said, I want to be alone. She said, I want to be left alone. I never said I want to be left alone. I only said I want to be let alone. There is all the difference.、Mm. Um, she did,、uh, of course, she was born in Sweden and she、uh, migrated to the US where she made、um, so, such films as The Flesh and the Devil, which is in the National Register. And then she famously left John Gilbert at the altar.、Um, then the, her first talking picture was advertised as Garbo Talks. And then、um, her second last penul- penultimate film,、um, Ninochka, which was her、um, biggest box office smash、um, just by. You know,、uh, herself,、um, that was labeled as Garbo Laughs, because usually she played these kind of tragic figures,、um, but very romantic figures. I mean, she had a very unique way of acting, like it was very physical.、Um, I would say it's, it's, not, it's not your modern day、uh, you know, method acting, it was very outside in. Like, depending on the gait,、uh, depending on the role, she would change her gait, she would change her walk. Like, if you look at something like、uh, Grand Hotel, where she just, she just floats through her scenes.、Um, whereas, maybe in the beginning of Ninochka or in Queen Christina, she's very stiff, you know, that cool beauty. And, you know, whereas, yeah, like in Camille, she's very flighty and just like, <gasps> yeah. Oh my goodness, she is the star. Like, it, it, you know, like even, you know, she, she appears in Madonna's Vogue、um, as one of the references. Like, she, she is Garbo.、Um, even though she was re- labeled box office poison, a lot of these big stars were labeled box office poison. As soon as she somewhat retired, 
MGM got on got on the boat and brought over uh, Ingrid Bergman to replace her. So obviously there was still a desire for a Swedish actress, even though really Ingrid Bergman wasn't. She she had a different feel, you know. She was mm, anyway. Um, but so an interesting thing about Garbo is she'd never had to make another film because she was an avid art collector and she was so savvy all of her all of her acquisitions you know, skyrocketed in value so anytime she ran out of money she sold a painting so so the, my little what if today is really <laughs> what if she wasn't as avid an art collector you know what if, what if what if she had to condescend to us lowly unwashed fans such as myself and and make another film now there, there were offers um now one that she actually went after which is a really interesting one is around 44 was the picture of dorian gray she wanted to play Dorian Gray and the producers, knowing that she had, you know, basically given up acting, were like, ah, oh, you know, she's this, the, you know, the, the ultimate star and every, everyone was clamoring to make sure that could happen. But ultimately MGM decided that it was just too, too gender bending, that maybe audiences couldn't quite handle um a Doreen Gray perhaps <laughs> um or her basically playing you know Dorian as as a man obviously but oh gosh this would have been amazing I would love to have seen what she had done with it oh she would have been amazing mm, can you imagine let's imagine this play was good enough for us Harry it was Romeo and Juliet I must admit that I was rather annoyed at the idea of seeing Shakespeare done in such a wretched hole of a place. Still, I felt interested in a sort of a way. At any rate, I determined to wait for the first act. There was a dreadful orchestra presided over by a young he who sat at a cracked piano that nearly drove me away. But alas, the drop scene was drawn up and the play began. Romeo was a stout elderly gentleman with corked eyebrows, husky tragedy voice and a figure like a beer barrel. Mercurio was almost as bad. He was played by a low comedian who had introduced gags of his own and was in most friendly terms with a pit. They were both as grotesque as the scenery and that looked as if they'd just come out of a country booth. But Juliet, Oh, Harry, imagine a girl, hardly 17 years of age, with a little flower-like face, a small Greek head with plaited coils of dark brown hair, eyes that were like violet wells of passion, and lips that were like the petals of a rose. She was the loveliest thing I've ever seen in my life. You said to me once that pathos left you unmoved, but that beauty mere beauty could fill your eyes with tears. I tell you, Harry, I could hardly see this girl for the mist of tears that came across me. And her voice. I never heard such a voice. It was very low at first, with deep, mellow notes that seemed to fall singly upon one's ear. Then it became a little louder and sounded like a flute or a distant hopoir. In the garden scene, it had all the tremulous ecstasies that one hears just before dawn when the nightingales are singing. There were moments, later on, when it had the wild passion of violets. You know how a voice can stir one? Your voice and the voice of Sybil Vane are two things that I shall never forget. When I close my eyes, I hear them, and each of them says something different. I don't know which to follow. Why should I not love her? Harry, I do love her. She's everything to me in life. Night after night, I go to see her play. One evening, she's Rosalind, and the next evening, she's Imogen. 
I have seen her die in the gloom of an Italian tomb, sucking the poison from her lover's lips. I have watched her wandering through the forest of Arden, disguised as a pretty boy, in hose and a doublet and a dainty cap. She has been mad, and she has come into the presence of a guilty king and given him rue to wear and bitter herbs to taste of. She has been innocent, and the black hands of jealousy have crushed her reed-like throat. I've seen her in every age and in every costume. Ordinary women never appeal to one's imagination. They are limited to this century. No glamour ever transfigures them. One knows their minds as easily as one knows their bonnets. One can always find them. There is no mystery in any of them. They ride in the park in the morning and chatter at tea parties in the afternoon. They have their stereotyped smile and their fashionable manner. They are quite obvious. But an actress, how different an actress is. Harry, why didn't you tell me that the only thing worth loving is an actress? Wait, you must not look at it. Not look at my own work? Well, you're not serious. Why shouldn't I look at it? I don't offer any explanation and do not ask for any. But if you try and look at that picture, Basil, on my word of honour, I will never speak to you again. What on earth is the matter with you? But this is monstrous. It's beyond nature, beyond reason. What does it mean? On the day you finished this painting, I made a wish. Perhaps you would call it a prayer. My wish was granted. But you told me you had destroyed my painting. It was wrong, and it has destroyed me. It has the eyes of the devil! Each of us has heaven and hell in him. If this is true, if this is what you've done with your life, it is far worse than anything that's being said of you. Do you know how to pray, Dorian? Okay, what did you think? Um, now, uh, a little bit later, she did apparently film a screen test for a film in 49. Now, I don't know what this one was for. Apparently it has resurfaced, but I couldn't find it. So my guess is that it might have been for Sunset Boulevard. She was one of the actresses offered um, Sunset Boulevard. Um, now this is a this is a lesson really for any actors who are listening. Don't ever feel disappointed by not being the first choice because you know even though Gloria Swanson was not the first choice to play Norma Desmond. She is. She embodies Norma Desmond. And, you know, Betty Davis wasn't the first choice to play Margot Channing, but she was Margot Channing. You know, and um, Terence Stamp and Priscilla, he wasn't the first choice. That went to, um, I think the first choice was, um, oh, Tim Curry, and then the next choice I think was John Cleese. So he wasn't the first choice, but can you imagine it with anybody else? I certainly can't, you know. And, and and the list goes. I mean, Keanu Reeves was the last choice for The Matrix, but could it? Could that film really have worked with anybody else? The well, last week I was suggesting Will Smith. I think it could have been great with Will Smith, but. I don't know, I love Keanu Reeves. Anyway, so back to Garbo. I think she was right to turn Boulevard down. And the reason is because I think Norma Desmond, I can see, you know, Billy Wilder probably wanted to work with her, with her because you know, she had been the great silent, silent, the great silent star. And you know, she 
She was known for playing these tragic figures, and Norma Desmond is a tragic figure. But Norma Desmond is also a very desperate figure. And Garbo never played desperate. You know, even in Queen Chris Christina, where she's she's lost the love of her life, she's not desperate. You know, she she takes it all in her stride stoically and looks into the camera and sails for Denmark for the next chapter of her life, which brings me to the film that I would have liked her to have made, Queen Christina Part II, um, because if you know the history of uh, Queen Christina of Sweden, um, her, the film only tells half of her life. And honestly, I wouldn't want anyone but Garbo to play her. And I think it would have been fascinating to, to see Garbo play the second half of her life where she's, um, you know, she becomes the Catholic and then she tries to take over another country but is thwarted by someone in her inner circle. And then she tries to, when, when her cousin passes away, she tries to go back and reclaim the crown in Sweden. But um, because they wanted to stay Protestant and she had converted to Catholicism, um, they wouldn't let her do it. Um, it's, it's interesting to note that, um, so the part directly after the, the film ends, she goes to Denmark, which was the enemy at the time of Sweden. And um, she dresses herself as a man and lives as a man as a way of being undercover. And when she leaves, she leaves with a lot of paintings and effects. So she still has a lot of money um, leaving Sweden high and dry. I think they're just fine now. Anyway, it just would have been such an interesting film. Um, so uh, let's take a look. So she was also originally chosen for lead roles in My Cousin Rachel in 1952, um, The Wicked Duchess, um, which she actually wanted to do, but it was never shot because of financial problems. Um, the Paradine case in 47. Um, the Paradine case uh, was a Hitchcock film. Can you imagine? Hitchcock, Gregory Peck, Charles Lawton, and Garbo. And it, this was nominated for an Oscar too. Um, oh, can, can you imagine how wonderful that could have been? Um, she was offered a million dollars to play this, to star as the Mother Superior in The Trouble with Angels in 66. Um, so, gosh, can you imagine? Um, there was, there was talk of her possibly, um, uh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Mm. Uh, in 48, she was offered the role of I Remember Mama, but she turned it down and Irene Dunn, of course, received a Best Actress Oscar nomination. <laughs> Excuse me. So there, there were so many opportunities, right? You know, but as she felt, nothing was right for her. Um, uh, I would have liked to have seen her. Um, I would have liked to have seen her in um, Murder on the Orient Express um, in the role of the Countess. You know, she wouldn't have had to say much. And it would have been nice to see her with um, Ingrid Bergman. You know, I'll just go back and speak to the Marlene Dietrich situation. It is interesting how, I mean, they, they were both this kind of cool beauty, right? So I can see why Dietrich was jealous, perhaps, or was worried that if Garbo 
came back that she wouldn't have the roles because obviously she she's in that to the position that I'm putting Garbo in where she had to occasionally take a role on um you know to to make ends meet and the thing is Dietrich is always you know she, she's always playing the role of a a German immigrant who was once a nightclub star in Germany you know famous for her legs so basically she played versions of herself in all of these films and still she's jealous of Garbo and you know these roles are virtually written for Dietrich so really she had no competition but in her heart of hearts she felt she had a competition with, with Garbo when you know there was none she could just be just be herself you know Garbo wasn't thinking of Dietrich I'm sure so anyway um back to Garbo it would have been fun to see her in Murder She Wrote um and it would have been fun to see her actually have a bigger part as opposed to that fleeting cameo that she has in Garbo Talks the Kerry Fisher film but anyway obviously none of this happened and Garbo is Garbo because she's Garbo you know <laughs> she she is that that ultimate enigma enigmatic mythical star because she was so enigmatic because she didn't have to work she didn't have to condescend to us lowly fans so i don't know i still would have liked to have seen the picture of dorian gray with her that would have been amazing and i don't know what do you think do you think she could have been norma desmond no mr de Niro. I'm ready for my close-up. <laughs> Could she have done it? She would have been in, it would have been a very different Norma Desmond. It would have been very different, but it would have been interesting to see her with Wilder. Anyway, what do you think? Sound off in the comments below. Thank you for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you like comment subscribe just do your best darling すいませんはい抹茶の入ったカクテルとかできますかもちろんですかしこまりました Today's video was brought to you by my debut feature film, Matcha and Vanilla, out now on Gaga Ooh La La.